Vietnamese Anglicus is not the kind of person who springs to mind when you think of great heroes of the Middle Ages. He wasn't a knight or a king, and he wasn't a saint who died for a cause in some spectacularly horrible way. He was born at the beginning of the 13th century and was a Franciscan scholar and a teacher, but not exactly an intrepid educator in that Robin Williams, Dead Poet Society kind of way. Now, I can't prove it, but I don't think he ever stood atop a desk in order to make his lessons more engaging to his students. In fact, one of the very few things we actually know about him is that he thought his students were very simple and very rude. I've been studying Bartolomeus for years now. My doctoral dissertation focuses on the types of images that appear in the encyclopedia he wrote, how he structured knowledge, and why, if his book was written for simple students, it was so popular amongst the intellectual elite of the 15th century. But as someone who teaches at the University of Victoria and acts as educator in residence for a technology company called MediaCore, I've spent a lot of time wondering what was going on in his classroom and how it resonates with the way we learn today. Bartolomeus doesn't tell us what frustrated him so much about his teaching, why he'd write about the foolishness of his students when he gave us so few personal details. But we can make a few guesses based on what other writers complain about. We can also look at the technological solution he devised for helping his students learn. One major problem he probably had was just the sense that there was way too much information. Bartolomeus and his students lived in their own information age and had their own information age struggles. They had to master their Aristotle, their Hugh of St. Victor, their Augustine, Pliny, Boethius, their moralistic legends, their natural history, not to mention, of course, the Bible itself. It was all just way too much. I mean, the average lifespan was just over 31 years old for a male child born around this time, so there are some serious constraints around lifetime learning in this context. There were a couple of solutions floating around to help solve this problem. The first, stop making new knowledge. Focus students on memorizing only the most important books and stop the madness of innovation. The second, use technology. And that's what Bartolomeus did when he wrote his encyclopedia for his students. He wasn't thinking of himself as a real expert. Like a bee collecting from flowers in order to make honey, he brought together what he thought everyone should know from a range of texts and put them in a meaningful order for his students. He was rethinking the technology of the book. But I think that what made the encyclopedia so successful at least by the time it started to gain a wider audience in the 15th century, was not that the teacher Bartolomeus had provided an easy answer book. See, we can tell from the kinds of illustrations that show up over and over again in these books that people used this technology to start important conversations among friends or with experts. This is how the really important learning took place. The moment of engagement where the passion for learning is so strong and social interaction is so meaningful that participants are able to construct a common vision of the world together. So the question becomes, how do we deploy our contemporary technology in the service of this kind of engagement? And how do we make this kind of learning experience available to everyone, not just the small group of aristocratic gentlemen we see in these illustrations? This is where educational models like the flipped classroom come in. It's about pushing the initial delivery of content to the best technologies communities have available, whether these are books or iPads. 
That way, we can put the time we spend together in a classroom or elsewhere towards creating a connection. This is not a new idea. What is new is that the number of people we want to share this engagement with is expanding. And we need to think about what contemporary tools we can use to make this happen. students having their heads in the cloud, they're not complaining about uh, aimlessly wandering minds in the way that someone like Bartholomaeus would have around 800 years ago. Instead, of course, we're complaining about this connection, the fact that they're plugged in to this invisible cloud of information that follows them wherever they go. They have constant access to data, and boy, do they ever use it. And if you don't believe me, just ask any parent who pays their teenager's cell phone bill. <laughs> Astounding. So the flipped classroom model is a teaching style that embraces and takes advantage of this natural tendency. The basic premise is that instead of standing up in front of the class and lecturing to them, you provide them with a video lecture, either one that you made yourself or perhaps something like a TED Talk, and you assign that as homework. And then when they come into class, you can spend that face time having meaningful interactions with the students. You can talk to them, give them personal attention, have discussions, or creating real-world experiences. In my classes at the University of Victoria, which you might have guessed, this often takes the form of taking them down into special collections where they can handle and interact with real medieval manuscripts. This is an actual bit of that education technology that I talked about in the video. And you can imagine how giving students the chance to get their hands on the real thing would add so much depth to the study of someone like Bartholomaeus. There are things that you just can't know about something like a manuscript without seeing it in person. This one, for example, like many manuscripts, smells an awful lot like old sheep, um, principally because that's what it's made of. But you can't tell this from an image. You have to see it in person. Equally fascinating, my students might get the chance to pick the brains of someone like Georgia Angelopoulos, who's in the audience here today. She's a practicing artist who makes manuscripts today. So passing around her quills and her brushes and getting a chance to stand over her while she's making manuscripts adds an experience and insight that you can't get anywhere online. The bottom line with all of this is that teachers cannot afford to be transmitters of information in an age where relentless information overload is the absolute norm. We have to change what we're doing. So to that end, I'm working on a project called the Flipped Institute, flippedinstitute.org. And what it is, is it's a, an online resource for teachers who want to change their practice from being lecturers to uh, having this more active teaching style. And yes, I'm fully aware of the irony of this situation that I've been bombarding you with information for the past eight minutes. So it's time to change all that. I would like to flip this talk and give you a chance to interact and ask you to help me build a resource for the teachers of the Flipped Institute. So, if you would take out your <coughs> cell phones, very rare experience, you have to turn them back off once I'm done or the other presenters will never forgive me. So, my question for you all is, what could a teacher do to get you more interested in learning? How could they inspire the passion for learning in you in a way that's interactive? So 
there are a couple of steps to this. It works through text message. So the cell phone number that you're going to text to, please, is 37607. And then in the body of your text message, type TEDxVic followed by your answer. So give it some thought. And I'm sorry? Can you repeat the question? What could a teacher do to inspire you to become more interested in learning? How could they ignite the passion? Mm. And so here is someone answering the question. Hey guys, hey, hey to you. <laughs> so what will happen is you can send your message up. Uh, we'll see them fly up onto the screen. <laughs> and you'll get an automatic text message back that'll tell you where you can find this resource in the future. So you can look at it at home, or if you have somebody in your life who's a teacher that you think might like to see this, um, then um, you know, please share it with them. So we'll give you a moment just to do this. Can you repeat the uh, number again? Yeah. Uh, 87607. <coughs> Focus on equality. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you keep texting. The poll will be open all day. If you forget the number, feel free to come and ask me about it again. But to wrap up, I'll say that the education technology industry has been around for a very long time, at least since the Middle Ages. And it became absolutely necessary the moment we started to feel like there was too much information for us to be able to handle. So as this industry gained more and more momentum, we need to think about why exactly managing this information in this way? Why incorporating technology to our classrooms is so important? What, tech, what educational goals can it help us meet? We have more tools than we have ever before that can help us make more interesting and entertaining classrooms. But really great teaching has absolutely nothing to do with whether all of our cell phones are turned on or whether they're all turned off. It has to do with making the best use of the technology we have available in order to create connections with each other. So thank you, and I'm looking forward to reading this. Yeah.